Welcome to the Salesman Podcast, where we interview the world's leading influence, body language, psychology, and sales experts to give you the information you need to close more deals and make more money. Additionally, for sales humor, tutorials, and entertainment, type salesman.red into your browser and come visit the world's largest community of millennial salespeople today. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to another Sales Moon podcast. On this episode, we have Judy Robinett, and she's sharing her tips on how to become a power connector. Now, networking is sometimes overlooked by salespeople, but I think it's one of those specific tools that can never be replaced with clever marketing or just cheaper methods of building relationships. And Judy is a clear industry expert and has lots of tips to share with us. Judy is the author of How to Be a Power Connector. She's known as being the woman with the titanium digital Rolodex. She's been featured in Fast Company, Forbes, Venture Beat, Huffington Post, pretty much everywhere. And she shares a lot of value in this episode. So without further ado, let's jump in to today's show. Hi, Judy, and welcome to the Salesman Show. Hi, really excited to be here. Awesome stuff. Well, we're going to talk about your book and I absolutely love it. I've got a copy sat here right next to me and we'll, we'll go cover that throughout the show and at the end of the show as well. But I want to talk first about the idea of cold calls. So I still do it occasionally, but not as much as what I used to. And I want to get your thoughts on cold calling Judy from a networking and getting in front of people perspective. Do you think that cold calls are still useful or do you think that through social media, through uh, face-to-face networking and actually getting in front of the person that you're trying to get in touch with through other means, which we can touch on, do you think there are better ways of going about it? Well, I do think there are better ways of going about it, but I still on occasion uh, will cold call people. For instance, I have found two or three book authors that I just really admired and felt that I should reach out and I... Uh, called on the phone and and actually became friends with them. Uh, Well, one I called on the phone and the other two I reached out on either LinkedIn or or Twitter. So I think it it can play an important role, but more importantly is you have so much access to people on social media that it kind of takes away that, you know, uh, pain in the gut about just picking up the phone and getting rejected. Mm -hmm. And do you feel that people are more receptive when you reach out on social media versus a cold call, which perhaps could be interrupting them? Yeah, yeah. Social media, certainly, because, you know, there's now close to 350 million people on LinkedIn and people join because guess what? They want to network. It's a top Mm -hmm. business professional networking site. And it also allows you to do your homework. I mean, if you look at what people tweet about uh, you find out what they care about. You do some some research on them and then reach out in a, a gracious manner. I've never had anybody turn me down. No, not at all. And same here. And I think there's a real opportunity here for salespeople that perhaps you can reach people that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily have gone straight to. And if you can offer them value from the very beginning of a relationship, you can d- bring them into your network a lot easier. And what are your thoughts on networking within B2B sales in general? I think it's probably as long as having as well as having a firm pipeline, I think that networking is probably up there as the the most biggest impact tool you can have in your salesperson bag. Absolutely. I, I just recently read a little book on how to be a rainmaker. And, you know, the guy pointed out that the the best way to find a huge group of clients is to find the the group on LinkedIn and there's millions of groups. And, you know, it's full of of people that are potentially your clients. And you can, you know, sit in and find out what's on their minds. You can uh, start providing value, share some of your thoughts. And pretty soon, you know, you've set yourself apart uh, above the the competitors. And you can, you know, start reaching out to those people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Judy, do we just reach out to every single prospect that we could potentially reach out to and try and become best friends with them or and obviously the, this is a loaded question we know the, yeah, the answer yeah. to it but yeah we don't have there, time is there, a, <laughs> <laughs> is there a system that we can put in place that helps us choose the the right amount of people that you can physically manage because 
we're not computers we are social beings yeah and yeah we've, we've grown up for hundreds of thousands of years in certain size groups of organizations so yeah tell us more about that and tell us more about it okay so Dun- it. you're referring to dunford's law and dunford's law says that groups fall apart at 150 that i, I mean even the roman armies were only grouped in groups of 150 and, and we know that. I, I mean, it, there's still people out there teaching how important working your territory territory mm-hmm. is. But, but the reality is you need to go for the big fish. You know, find who the most important players are. If you're trying to hit a quota, think about, you know, where the, the good fish, the big fish are. And you can do this with several uh, types of uh, organizations. You can attend groups. For instance, it's a global group called ACG, the Association of Corporate Growth, or ACG. And this has been in existence since, I think, 1948, and it has CXO-level executives, and, and they are networked, you know, all over the world. And so if you go to one of those groups, then you've really increased your potential trajectory instead of just going after people, you know, one at a time. So you need to be okay, careful so- who you're, you're targeting. And I talk about, you know, quality relationships plus strategy to your goal. And so, you know, if, if your goal is to meet the CX level people, then find out where they hang out so you can get in the right room. So I know people now will be listening and thinking, which is how I've felt in the past as well, of sure, I need to, the, the CXOs are the decision makers for the product that I'm selling. I need to be in front of them. When I'm introduced and I meet them, I am fine in that conversation, but I would be nervous walking into a room where I perhaps would feel out my depth. What are your thoughts on that, Jude? Do you think is it is it valid to feel out your depth as a lowly salesman versus a room of these executives, or do we just put them on a pedestal when they're just people? You know, they are they are just people, and you know, all of us hunger for appreciation. Mary Kay once said she knew what people wanted more than money and sex, and it was to be acknowledged and and appreciated. And it turns out every billionaire, millionaire, movie star all has problems. We all have problems and we all have solutions. And But I'll tell you, I mean, I grew up shy, bullied. If any of you saw the movie Napoleon Dynamite, I went to that high school. <laughs> and, you know, I knew nobody of wealth, money, or, or influence. And even if I had, I wouldn't have dared to talk to them. And, and I'd been raised, the research shows, if you're raised lower to middle class, uh, you're very scared to ask and, and you're fearful of being rejected. But, you know, I read How to Win Friends and Influence People and I started talking to people and I found out people like me just fine. And the the point is you realize connections are first made personally. I mean, you, you know, I'm really against the typical kind of elevator speech that comes across to me as very uh, robotic, uh, cold, uh, you know, people first judge you on your level of warmth and then your, your level of competence. And so I, you know, I tell people to, to be brave like I was, just say hello, shake hands. The two things that I teach people uh, talking to strangers is offer a genuine compliment or ask a question. And, and I can give you a, a great example. So I'm uh, speaking at USA Today on, on Friday. I get on the subway to go down to the National Art Museum, and I sit down by this woman, and and I ask, um, I I think I'm on the going the right direction, and I said, does this train stop at the Smithsonian? And she said, oh yes, and I could tell she had a bit of an accent, so I asked her where she was mm-hmm. from, Russia. She asked what I was doing. I told her I was here for a book festival, and she said, you know, I'm I'm a VP at the Washington Post. Would you like to come in and talk about your book? Oh my gosh. I, I mean, <laughs> so there was a stranger, you know, and, and this happens to me all, all the time. So it's important to just connect personally and, and realize you can add value if, if nothing else being kind. I mean, a smile is a gift and, you know, it sounds simple, but it, it really isn't. And do you think that this is a problem with the generation of millennials in the and I found this. I did an experiment where I give up my smartphone for about three months. Yeah, it was 12 weeks, three months. And I had this, it was really poor and atrocious, this Samsung flip phone that it could barely text on. And so from that, two things happened to me. I spent a lot more time actually on the phone speaking with people <laughs> rather than texting back and forth. But it was such a, a ball ache to use that I never surfed the internet or anything on it. And so if I was in a queue, 
I would just automatically turn around and to speak to the person behind me and just start chatting. Do you think that there's a generation gap here between people that perhaps would have had or people wouldn't have had a phone to chat with? So they'll, they'll talk to people more often, whereas millennials will just sit on the phone and talk to people that might be the other end of the dinner table, but they'll talk to them over Facebook rather than communicate in person. Yeah, and, and I think it is a problem. I mean, I, I met a, a person just recently and she said that she had uh, sent an email and someone in the, the office about, uh, you know, coming and, and talking and and uh, she went to the office and, and talked to him and he sent her a text and said, don't bother coming and talking to me, just send me a text. And he came pretty close to getting fired. Wow. And so <laughs> you, you understand that the higher you go in life is your communication skills. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is wide. It isn't just your ability to send texts. You have to connect with people, head, heart, and gut. Uh, and that requires more than, you know, just, just texting. And, and many of the very famous people in the world, if they were asked what is the number one thing, reason they succeeded, it was their ability to build rapport, to connect with this human mm -hmm. being. Okay, so let's touch on rapport then. There's a lot of research on body language and mirroring and, and there's NLP and things like that, which I think may pre provide a tiny bit of value, but I think most of that can be achieved by just being genuinely interested in the people that you're meeting and asking good questions. Absolutely. Are there any strategies from your perspective, Judy, that people can use to build rapport with people quicker, especially when they've just first met them? Um, so you mentioned no elevator pitch, being brave, shaking hands and uh, asking a question and compliments. Is, is there any specifics there that we can build on? Um, you know, if you just focus on them, if you get out of your head and focus on them, I've had people pretend that they were best friends. And it's really interesting how different you treat a stranger rather than someone that you know. And if you mm -hmm. act like they're a friend or they're going to be a friend, that can be uh, very helpful. But you know, connect with their, their pets. Everybody cares about their family, their health, their money, and their pets, everybody. And so if you just realize this is another human being who has pain, sorrow, suffering, like we, we all do, and uh, you, you need to just be real, be authentic. You know, people will say to me, uh, I've heard people say, well, you can't talk about religion. Well, I often tell people I'm a cross between Utah Mormons and West Virginia Southern Baptist hillbillies, who then found out my last name was Klein, so I probably have, you know, a, a bit of Jewish ancestry as well. And I tell that, and people just laugh, and they will come up and talk to me. And so you can tell a joke, you can, you know, make fun of yourself a little bit, but just be vulnerable and show that you're a real person. And the more you do that, then the more endearing you become to the other person. Yep. Okay. So let's well, let's do this step by step then. So you meet that person, you, you've had, you know, that bit of small talk and you built rapport and you can tell the other person, well, that they're not agitated by you or that you're not annoying them and you want to get to know them further. What is that next step then? So it's obviously massively context dependent, but should you be asking for business cards? Should you be trying to get a phone number or an email address? You know, or... I will usually say, you know, uh, may, you know, I'd really look forward to talking to you again. Could we, you know, be in, be in touch or I'm on LinkedIn. I'd love to follow up with you. Uh, and nine times out of 10, you know, the person will say, you know, absolutely. And mm -hmm. if they've got a business card, you can ask, you know, for, for a business card. I often don't have them with. And kind of the, the, the thing over here is uh, just link in on, on LinkedIn or, or follow me on Twitter. You know, and I say the same thing to people. Check out my website. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on, on Twitter. And just so everything you do says who you are. I mean, if you start with that premise, everything you do. So you want to show people you're warm. You want to show people you're generous. If you can find out a little bit about them and what their goals are, where they're headed for, then you can help. And, and this sounds, you know, uh, just as an example, Mark Burnett of Shark Tank fame uh, endorsed my book. I didn't know Mark. Um, I had a friend who'd been invited to dinner with him. And so I called him and I said, what does Mark need? Because guess what? We all need stuff. And he mm -hmm. said, well, he and his wife, Roma Downey, just did Son of God movie. They spent 16 to 18 million of their own dollars. They're trying to figure out how to get this thing marketed. 
And so I did a little research online. I quickly found out the Catholics were behind them, the Baptists were behind them. Well, I lived in Salt Lake. You know, there's 16 million Mormons, LDS folks around the globe. And so I figured out, um, I had a couple of contacts, called them, found out they, of course, would they be thrilled to interview Roma Downey? You bet, you know, famous actress. And so I called my friend. I said, I know Mark is going to be at Sundance for his movie. Uh, tell him I'd like to meet. I've got some answers, some connections for him that would help him. And the next thing I knew, I was going to dinner with, with Mark. And I said, you know, you need to do this, 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 and this. And he looked at me and said, who are you? And then he, <laughs> and then he said, uh, you know, what, what, are you, what do you do? And I told him I had this book coming out. He said, is there anything I could do to help? I asked if mm-hmm. he would be willing to read it and endorse it. And he said, is there anything else? I said, you know, I'd love to get my book to Oprah. And he said, she's a friend. So there's wow. an example of somebody that, you know, clearly is way above my level uh, on, you know, making money. But guess what? We've got some of the same uh, problems. You know, we're, we're human beings. You know, he needed some help. I could offer some help. And, and you can mm-hmm. literally do that with anybody. I think there's a massive lesson there, Judy, in that you, you don't have to be closing business 24-7 because spending your time building some strategic partners could close bigger business than you'd ever get by picking up the phone and just hammering numbers in and not spamming people because the the listeners of the show wouldn't go that far. They're they're trained and educated enough not to do that. But being more strategic about selling is, is, is it's gotta be the future, hasn't it? Yes, it it absolutely is. I was just, uh, I was reached out to by a company that has recently gone public. So they're doing very well, but they're doing cold calling and their success rate is 4 to 6%. Oh my gosh, if they move to relationship building and getting quality referrals and mm-hmm. and doing that, they would double, triple their business. For sure. Okay, so talking about the future of selling then and how that relates to relationship building and everything else, how important do you think that you need an, or how important do you think it is to have an online presence? And you mentioned it then of when you would meet someone, you'd say, oh, check me out online or add me on LinkedIn. But if there's not much on there or you look very average on there, it, it's not leaving a good impression, is it? For salespeople, how important do you think it's going to be moving forward that they have to appear and, and not even appear, they have to be an expert in their niche? Yeah, I, th- I think it is important and you can become a, uh, a thought leader and I'll give you a, a couple of books that you can add on the show notes, Will, that will help people. And, you know, I did this early in my career by just writing a small piece in the company newsletter, which sets you apart very quickly. And mm-hmm. then you can find little second, third tier magazines. You don't have to have something published in Fortune or the Financial Times or or get on Bloomberg. But you can just do little things that would set you apart that show that you learn that you can offer uh, solutions. And so I, I think it's important to have a presence but because I'll tell you, every single person, I mean, when people hire me to give speeches or, uh, you know, come train, that I will inevitably hear, I Googled you. That will be the first yep. thing. Yep. And oh, we see you've been interviewed by bloggers on Fortune and Forbes and, and geez, you've got a book out. Now, you know, it's very simple to do an ebook. And so it's simple uh, to form your own opinions and start voicing those on on some format so you can have your your own brand, I think is absolutely critical because other people will do it and they're going to stand out. And, you know, when you're younger, this sounds, you know, tough, but I would just tell you to take just a a few uh, little steps, you know, find the key rainmaker that that you work with and go and say how did how did you do this you know what other ideas do you have for me who else do you know i should talk to and i call those the two golden questions and if you do that even with your key 25 relationships you'll be amazed at what happens Mm -hmm. i think a lot of this is getting out of your comfort zone and making that first step to become what is essentially a, a public figure because when you're a salesperson, you can, you, if you wanted to, you can hide behind the company that you're working for. Whereas when you start to build that personal brand, then you've got an opportunity, if you grow it and you do become that expert, that people will then come to you and want to network with you because you've, you've obviously got that network of people there. There's an exchange which doesn't have to be in money. It can be in contacts, and you, you come up with numerous examples of this in the conversation so far. And I think that's really important for salespeople to get into the heads that it's not all about 
pipeline, it's all about who you know that can potentially build that pipeline even faster in the future. Yeah, your relationship critical will be your number one asset. I mean, study after study shows your network equals your net worth. Mm -hmm. And the reason is everything's attached to people. You know, they know the opportunities, they know the deals, they, they know who needs to hire. And so it's all, you know, it's important. And, you know, you can hide for a while, but what happens when you leave that company and go to a, another company? It's like you're, you have no presence. So you need to have some presence. Well, if you have that presence and you're obviously good at what you're doing and you're, you're bringing in uh, and you're hitting, you're hitting your targets, you almost become unsackable or you, you become on a fast track to senior management at that point because you, you're bringing your clients and customers with you rather than they would stay with the company if you left. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Judy. So managing these contacts then. So we know the, the rough numbers that we need to be looking at. We know that we should be pushing our comfort zones and reaching out to those people who can really make an impact on our lives and, and the influencers. Salespeople might have a company CRM, for example, that can do some of the legwork perhaps in scheduling calls or reminding them to send emails. For people who either don't have that or want to build their personal network, are there any tools you recommend to keep on top of all this? Because I know myself, I'll speak to people and I'll have the best intentions of following up with them once a month or once every couple of weeks. But with the different things that come in from business and just life in general, they can get lost in the wayside. So are there yeah. any tools you use that can automate or give prompts on this? Yeah, so Viper is is one of my favorite apps. It's free for iPhones and it's a contact manager and it was developed by Mike Muni, who is the co-founder of Axe Software, sold it for $48 million. So he's kind of the father of the CRM world. And, and I like that, but something I recommend to people, and I have it on my website, is just a simple little spreadsheet on Excel. And, and you really only need 25 to 50 key relationships. And if you mm -hmm. map out what you've already got, everybody's got relationships and, and a level of network right now. And then if you map it out, you can see obvious introductions you can make to people to add value. Yeah. You can see holes where you need to fill in, and, and that will really help. And, and then if you just have, you know, once a week that you spend 20 minutes, you know, finding a key piece of information that you can share with some critical folks that's really good, then you become kind of the go-to person. People go, oh, my gosh, you know, this guy is well-educated, well-read. They're obviously generous. This is a person I'd want to do business with. Definitely, definitely. I think becoming that hub within the community, which is it's essentially what Upgraded Salesman, and I say, I almost said it as if it was a person then, but... That's what we're doing here at Upgraded Salesman in that we've got the world's best sales experts writing for us. We've got them in the magazine. We've got them coming on the podcast. We've got experts like yourself, Judy, and we're doing a bunch of videos shortly. I think becoming that hub is is key to all of this. Yeah, and and I'll refer some great people to the show, Will. Bob Berg, who wrote The Go-Getter, and you know mm -hmm. he's an introvert, uh, but just a great expert on on sales. And, and like me, he, he knows it's all based on relationships. And if you think about it in life, uh, some of the best things happen to you because you've worked hard and, and done all the right things, got the right education, you've studied. But if you, the second thing is luck, you know, like these lucky things that happen and you actually can make luck happen by how you position yourself. And, and one of the most profound is to join a couple of powerful groups. And, uh, and, and, and you see this in organizations in, in cities or in, in regions. And, you know, if you do that, then that, that'll put you out there as a thought leader. For sure, for sure. And I guess people in those groups, you're only going to get people going there who want to network. You, by yes. default, yes. you're with the right people. Yeah, you? they want to network and they'll help you. I, I mean, they'll help you. And I think I mentioned before, research shows if you're lower to middle class that, you know, we're taught not to ask. And I mean, it was a real shock to me to start asking people and finding <laughs> out they were delighted to help me For and sure. wanted to. Definitely. There's there's a weird kind of ceiling, low middle class of, well, there's research that showed that you earn plus or minus 20% of your parents. There's psychological barriers there and there's a whole world of psychoanalysis we could dive into, which would explain some of it. But that asking for help is something that we've talked about before and it's something that I had a problem with as well. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that and I think it's it's an important tool. It is. It's critical. So Judy, just before you tell us a little bit more about your book, and uh, I go on about my massive endorsement for it because I absolutely love it, which I don't say to everyone who comes on the show. So that, that's, that's a genuine, genuine endorsement from my perspective. 
I've got a couple of questions that we ask everyone who comes on the show. So you've kind of covered this one when we touched about the future selling before, but where do you see sales changing or how do you see sales changing over the next five years? You know, I think the focus is going to be totally on relationships because people are tired of being burned with transactions. Mm -hmm. And they they want to make sure that they know people like them and, and trust them. So I, I think it's absolutely critical and you'll see the focus shift to relationships. I think you're going to see more and more platforms. You know, I get asked to do webinars for Monster.com, Citibank. So there's all kinds of ways that you can now get to a very target market and show people what you've got. So, so I think the technology is huge. Uh, the world is more connected than it's ever been before. But, you know, we need really good sales folks who understand building relationships. So I think there's just tremendous opportunity. For sure, for sure. I totally agree with everything you mentioned then, Judy. And next one, who do you think is the world's greatest salesperson? So it doesn't have to be a salesperson. Yeah, well, I would, you know, I would say Warren Buffett. You know, everything yeah. that comes out of that man's mouth, people listen to. I, you know, if whatever company he buys, people go get the stock. I mean, he's a perfect <laughs> example of a guy with a, you know, great relationships. He does deals on a handshake. He's viewed as one of the most trustworthy people uh, probably in the world. He certainly is number one in the, the United States. And, uh, you know, people bring deals to him because they want to be a part of his world. And interesting, Charlie Munger, who is his business partner, once said out of 100 people he meets, there's five he can't live without, 20 he never wants to see again as long as he lives, <laughs> and 75 that are kind of opt-in. So I tell people, yeah. you know, everything you do says who you are. What are you letting people see about you? And make sure you're one of those five that you're almost like a magnet attracting people much like Warren does. And he's not selling anything. Love it. Absolutely love it. What is one book that you'd recommend to the upgraded salesman audience other than your own? So one that I've recently started reading um, is How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare. So I've always been fascinated with human behavior and, you know, why you can't close a deal and you know, some people you do and some people you don't. Humans are just really fascinating. And I've never been quite able to understand, even though I've got a degree in psychology. <laughs> and, and I read an article that said, if you really want to understand human behavior, study the Bible and study Shakespeare. And I, and I just found this book. And I have found it really helpful in understanding how humans think and seeing scenarios and, you know, great problems in life. It helps you understand uh, you know, suffering, fear, betrayal, but also courage and how to overcome fear. Um, and, and so, you know, much to my surprise, it's become one of my favorite little books. Wow. It's totally off the ball. Is that, can you remember where the article came from? Uh, you know, I don't, but I'll send you the name of the, the uh, author uh, of, of this book. And, and uh, you know, it's fascinating to, to read the famous uh, Shakespearean uh, speeches. And, you know, this is hundreds and hundreds of years old. And you would think it's, you know, you read that and you go, oh, yeah, I've got a Lady Macbeth in my life. Uh, <laughs> and, and you can figure out a lot of stuff that you hadn't really thought of as far as motivations and, and a little bit about how the world uh, work. So I've started moving back to, you know, some of the, the classics. It reminds me, well, it, it's part of a book, I think it's called The Secrets of the Ages. It was written a, a long, long time ago, but it quotes, it's a it's, it, it's a self-help book, but before self, self-help existed, from what I understand of it. And it's kind of half ye old English and half just uh, understandable, but it quotes the Bible and Shakespeare all the way through it. And yeah, some of the quotes that from his work you're absolutely incredible so i'm totally on the ball with that and i'll be checking out myself judy okay and i've got one final question for you and i know you're i don't think you class yourself as a as a salesperson specifically but you obviously those skills go across many different industries and, and areas of work so this question will still be applicable to you and that is if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self what would be one piece of advice you'd give her to make her a better salesperson? I would really confront fear. And, and as long as you're alive, you're going to have fear. And fear doesn't really go away. But if you don't deal with it, it gets worse. And mm -hmm. usually if you're brave enough to get out of your comfort zone, you find out the, the fear was useless. 
And I recently read that there's two words for fear in Hebrew. And the first one is that kind of gosh awful fear of, you know, what, what I do is run to my cave with a piece of dark chocolate, but panic <laughs> and, and terror and, you know, henny penny, the sky's falling, the sky's falling. But the second one is good fear of when you're stepping up and stepping out, that you're getting to the next level, you're getting that great account. And if I would have realized there's a, a good fear and have just, you know, taken a deep breath and said, mm -hmm. yes, I can do this, you know, I would have done that a lot earlier on. Uh, and ask, you know, people for help. The second fear probably comes after a split second of the first one, and it's whether you can get over that hurdle, isn't it? Yes, yeah, the lizard brain. I mean, you really have to be cautious of the lizard brain and realize that your feelings aren't facts, and oftentimes your thinking isn't factual. And this is why it's so important to surround yourself with good advisors and folks that can help you get better reality, as Jack Welch says, because we all yeah. have blind spots, particularly when we're younger. I mean, I meet people all the time and they don't see their gifts. They don't see that they've got huge future potential. And I'll often have them do a victory log. Just take a piece of paper and write victory log at the top and neighbor, number it from one to 50 and write down things you've proud you've accomplished. You know, I first wrote down when I made 30,000 a year and I wrote down when I made 350,000 a year. And, you know, after I'd made 40 trips to Europe and I never planned on doing, you know, either of those higher end things. Mm -hmm. And you can look at it and go, yes, you know, I, I can move, I can grow, I can succeed. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Well, Judy, just before we wrap up, we've mentioned it a couple of times, but I know the audience are going to be wanting to check it out. Can you tell us a little bit more about your book and where the audience can find out more about it? So my book is How to Be a Power Connector, the 550 plus 100 rule for turning your business network into, into profits. And you can find it on Amazon. You can order it at, at bookstores. And, and I wrote it because I wanted people to see that everything you need is already around you. There's 7 billion people, 369 trillion in private global wealth countless opportunities, so much information, it doubles every six months, and we put it in the cloud. Those are all the building blocks of, of any goal that you would need to achieve. And, you know, it all is attached to people, and there's lots of people, but you have to get in the right room. Most people don't have the dots. They can't connect the dots, or they can't leverage the dots. So I wanted to write a book that really had a simple system, that you only need 25 to 50 people, and really talk to how important it is to be warm generous and and have uh, a level of gravitas or, or leadership mm -hmm. like we were talking about branding so people otherwise they can't find you well judy given a lot of value to the audience today they'll appreciate it i appreciate it and i want to thank you for taking the time coming on the salesman show thank you very much will <laughs>